Welcome to a special edition of Breakthroughs. I'm Erin Spain, Communications Director at Feinberg. Today we're sharing a recent medical Grand Rounds presentation called COVID-19, an update on the current situation. This talk was given at Northwestern Medicine on March 17th, 2020 by Dr. Michael Eisen, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Professor of Surgery in the Division of Transplant Surgery at Northwestern. He discusses the virology and epidemiology of COVID-19, as well as predictors of patient outcome and strategies to manage patients with the infection. Dr. Eisen is chair of the Adaptive COVID-19 Clinical Trial through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. He is currently seeing patients with COVID-19. Dr. Eisen does refer to PowerPoint slides in this talk, and you can access those slides by signing into Northwestern's Continuing Medical Education Portal. Again, this talk was recorded March 17th, 2020. So coronaviruses are uh, enveloped viruses. The advantage of this is that uh, our alcohol and soaps uh, disperse the uh, uh, membrane, uh, releasing the uh, spike proteins to make the virus no longer infectious. This is why hand hygiene is critically important uh, for these uh, viruses. It's a single-stranded RNA virus with a single piece, so there's no risk of reassortment like influenza. There's a uh, uh, gene, uh, exonuclease gene that's encoded that actually reduces the the, uh, frequency of mutations in this virus. Again, something uh, different from some of the other respiratory viruses. There are a number of uh, human uh, viruses uh, that cause common colds. Uh, One of the things uh, that I think we all need to recognize is that these viruses can circulate year-round, but predominantly peak in the fall and the spring seasons. And so uh, that may be where the seasonality of this virus may lie. Uh, Among animal coronaviruses, the ones that have affected humans have all been beta uh, coronaviruses. Uh, SARS-CoV-1, which uh, caused an outbreak in 2002. MERS-CoV that caused uh, an outbreak predominantly in the Middle East and South Korea uh, and is still ongoing. And then, of course, our current uh, SARS coronavirus. In terms of uh, phylogenetics, uh, this uh, shows you uh, where these viruses lie compared to one another. The human uh, viruses are very much divergent uh, from the uh, animal ones, with uh, the SARS-CoV-1 and 2 being slightly uh, more closely related than MERS-CoV. And I think that's important for us to recognize when we start thinking about extrapolating data uh, from these viruses. How uh, does this virus infect our cells? It uses the uh, ACE2 receptor, which is on a number of uh, tissues, including uh, the lung airway, the heart, and vascular endothelium. Uh, The virus replicates uh, both in the upper and lower airway with a predominance uh, for uh, uh, replication uh, in the lower airway. Uh, Yields uh, for testing uh, are slightly higher, uh, and viral loads tend to be higher in the lower airway than in the upper airway. As with most coronaviruses, although the number of patients that have had serologic responses uh, studied with this virus are very uh, limited, um, there appears to be rapid uptick uh, in uh, IgM, followed a week or so later by a rise in IgG. Um, We would expect, as with the other uh, bat coronaviruses infecting humans as well as seasonal coronaviruses, that these uh, antibody titers will wane over time, uh, and so risk of reinfection is possible uh, in every two to three year uh, intervals. We're all very familiar with the uh, uh, timeline uh, of this uh, infection. The first cases were uh, seen, uh, but not quite identified at the beginning of December. The first cluster identified December 26 with the virus identified January 7th. I think it's important to put this in perspective, not only by our technologic advancements, but also some of the uh, communication and data sharing. Um, If you compare this with SARS uh, about uh, almost two decades uh, earlier, uh, it took six to seven months to identify what the virus was. Uh, There was some delay in sharing the information. So we really did a much uh, better uh, job. Uh, And clearly, a pandemic was just uh, declared uh, recently. We're all familiar with the uh, current uh, rates of uh, uh, this virus globally. Thankfully, new cases are markedly down in China, uh, but still rising very precipitously uh, in uh, the United States uh, and Europe. I think many people have uh, seen this uh, uh, on the uh, web uh, that was published in uh, Financial Times which really shows that the rate of uh, increase with about a 33% uh, daily increase 
has been pretty consistent across all countries with the exception of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, as well as Japan. Uh, and again, part of this was due to slight differences in early uh, social distancing, uh, quarantine rules, and in, especially in the case of uh, Singapore, uh, strict controls uh, over their society. I think the other thing that's very interesting is South Korea. They instituted widespread testing uh, very early on, and that really uh, change their curve so that it's much more flat with less uh, increase uh, recently. Uh, this is an important slide that comes from one of the first uh, a series of patients uh, with uh, a coronavirus. Uh, and what you can see in the bluish uh, green uh, di lines are when people first become symptomatic and the yellow lines uh, for when the, they become hospitalized. And you can see you have about a one week period of time uh, between when symptoms start and when the uh, number of admissions starts uh, increasing. You can also see that, that uh, there was definitely some earlier cases that were caught later when investigation into uh, severe outcomes and deaths uh, occurred, uh, identifying cases as far back as December uh, 8. In terms of what we know, uh, again, we have to recognize that most of the data that's coming out of China is coming from patients that have been hospitalized or are severely ill. But from this, uh, we can say the number of days after infection to onset of symptoms is somewhere between three and seven days. The uh, time uh, from uh, symptom onset to clinical visit is about one to two days uh, uh, in China. And uh, time from uh, symptom onset uh, to uh, hospitalization is around nine days. Uh, it's about a day or so later of those patients that are gonna progress to critical illness uh, that they develop uh, a respiratory distress as well as need for ICU level care. In terms of what we're seeing in terms of populations, the majority of uh, patients, at least in China, have been a little older as we've been getting data out of South Korea and they've been testing patients that had milder symptoms and a broader range of patients, including ambulatory patients. We're seeing the proportion of younger individuals uh, uh, increasing. But from the data in China, the majority of the patients uh, were in the 15 to an older age group. In terms of risk factors, uh, and this has been something that's been heavily uh, focused on, the majority of uh, people that develop severe disease were people who had underlying medical conditions. The most common uh, underlying medical conditions were diabetes and hypertension. In terms of uh, outcomes of these patients, about 5% uh, required ICU level care. 2.3% required mechanical ventilation and 1.4% uh, died. This is a uh, diagram of the relative age distribution, again showing kind of peaks in the 50 to 70 year old uh, age group, slightly lower numbers in the older, but as I'll show you shortly, uh, it, those are the populations that uh, get the sickest. In terms of clinical presentation, uh, patients uh, initially will develop a uh, dry cough and fatigue, Fever oftentimes develops uh, shortly thereafter and may become very high. Patients that progress to more severe disease uh, typically have much higher fevers. Uh, hemoptysis is a hallmark of uh, progression to uh, more severe infections. And laboratory studies uh, decrease white count, particularly lymphocytes uh, and uh, renal dysfunction are harbingers of uh, clinical progression. There are a number of atypical symptoms uh, that may be uh, presenting in these patients uh, as well, although in a relatively low percentage of patients. To the uh, uh, right on this slide is a flow diagram uh, that uh, was developed by UCSF, um, which really I think is very helpful in helping you kind of think through um, how to uh, think about a patient that you are potentially evaluating, uh, uh, whether or not they have uh, uh, COVID-19 or another alternative uh, illness. I'm not gonna spend time on this uh, in detail, uh, but uh, these slides will be made available uh, after the fact. I've already made them available on Twitter and Facebook. In terms of mortality, again, I think we have to be uh, very cautious a bit with this, um, the, particularly at the younger age group, since they weren't testing uh, as many patients. These are predominantly people coming to the hospital. But what is clear is that mortality increases with age in a stepwise uh, progression, 3.6% for the people in their 60s, 8% for people in their 70s, and 15% in uh, people in their 80s. Um, I wanted to highlight two special populations where there's uh, relatively good data. Um, the first is uh, uh, patients uh, with 
with uh, cancer. Uh, again, these patients clearly have an increased risk of progressing to needing ICU level care uh, and death. Um, uh, and so this is a population uh, that will probably have atypical symptoms, may have a lack of fever, um, for which we will probably need to pay additional care. Since my uh, sister-in-law is due to deliver tomorrow, I'm very focused on pregnancy. Um, and thankfully, a publication uh, came out uh, this week uh, with the first uh, nine patients that were recognized in China that were pregnant. Thankfully, uh, it does not appear that there's more severe disease from these limited numbers. Um, the uh, babies uh, oftentimes uh, were delivered early, uh, in part because of illness in the mother. There was some evidence of uh, uh, some preterm labor in these uh, women, uh, no evidence of uh, transmission, and they did do uh, virology uh, with that uh, as well. Um, we do have to keep this uh, in the back of our mind because both SARS and MERS had clearly worse outcome in pregnancy. And I think as we see more and more pregnant uh, women potentially getting infected, uh, as we get uh, more uh, data from the world, we'll have to keep an eye on this. We also had a recent study, which I think is going to be very, very helpful for us uh, in uh, looking at our patients and I think should drive some of our uh, protocols. Um, the, one of the things that they looked at is biomarkers that are predictive of uh, worse uh, outcome, uh, particularly non-survivors. Uh, the clearest separation is in D-dimers, and I, I personally feel that we should be checking D-dimers in every patient that are here in the hospital uh, and trend them with their uh, daily labs. Um, looking at some of the patients that we have now, uh, there's clearly a sharp uptick in their uh, D-dimers in the patients that are requiring ICU-level care. Other markers of inflammation are, may also be helpful, uh, uh, as well as uh, markers of lung destruction, uh, such as uh, LDH. IL-6 is not something that we readily test for here in the United States, is commonly tested for in Asia, is a uh, useful marker and maybe a marker for who uh, uh, we should intervene on with some of our interventions. All of us are fixated on the challenges we've had in the United States with poor testing. Uh, and to be blunt, it's an embarrassment uh, that we still are the uh, country with the lowest uh, testing rate. Uh, thankfully, this is uh, increasing as uh, shown in this uh, lower graph. Uh, and we'll probably hear about our efforts uh, here a little bit later. This is uh, the current map of cases uh, in the United States, as well as some of the top states uh, in terms of case numbers and fatalities. Clearly, although the numbers are highest uh, in New York, uh, the burden and impact uh, is greatest currently in the uh, greater Seattle and suburban areas uh, of Washington. One of the unfortunate perks of uh, Seattle being one, the first introduction in the United States and a, a heavy uh, area of uh, disease is that probably the world's expert in phylogenetics is uh, there, Trevor Brett Bedford, and he has uh, a website that everyone can access, Next Strain. He does weekly blogs where he talks people through in uh, very uh, easy terms uh, about what these mean. Uh, and I think we get some really uh, interesting uh, perspectives from some of this early data. He demonstrated, uh, for example, that there were clearly two introductions of uh, COVID-19, uh, or SARS-2, uh, in Italy that were two different viruses, uh, and that he's been able to demonstrate that there have been about uh, uh, a dozen or so introductions to other countries, Mexico, Brazil, Switzerland, uh, other areas of uh, Europe, uh, from patients traveling from uh, Italy. Uh, he also was able to demonstrate very early on that the second uh, patient in the nursing home was linked uh, to the initial patient uh, uh, phylogenetically, suggesting um, that there was some ongoing community uh, transmission. We do have some uh, un, uh, knowledge gaps in our current knowledge, and I think that is an important thing. We will learn more as the uh, Europe and the United States uh, start seeing cases. Uh, there's been, uh, there's likely a significant component of asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic disease um, that uh, likely resolves on its own. Uh, we don't have a lot of testing of those patients, and, and uh, that likely will change our mortality estimates. Testing has generally been limited to contacts and hospitalized patients, again, slightly overestimating severity. And to date, there are no seroepidemiology uh, studies, although there's one that's ongoing in Singapore and China uh, that should give us some idea of uh, the proportion of the population uh, that has uh, been affected. 
Transmissibility, the number one question that people have, and uh, unfortunately there's, uh, there's uh, suggestive data, but nothing that's been studied to definitively. There's uh, limited data on transmissibility at uh, various levels of clinical disease, particularly those patients that have milder asymptomatic uh, disease. Healthcare transmissions, uh, thankfully, has been light, uh, less than some of the other uh, uh, coronaviruses, but they are still there. It was about 3.5% uh, in the uh, Chinese experience, uh, and from talking again from the Italians last night on a call that I was on, there's a fair number of patients uh, in Italy that uh, healthcare workers that have uh, become infected. Um, the true risk of progressive diseases, we recognize that the elderly and those with underlying comorbidity, as well as those patients with lymphopenia and evidence of bilateral pneumonia, clearly are at higher risk of progression, um, but uh, we need uh, further data to understand this. There's been lots of modeling. Unfortunately, every time a model comes out, it looks worse and worse. Um, so this is a, a, one of the earlier models uh, uh, here um, that takes into account uh, the, the uh, uh, criteria that uh, mostly I've talked about so far. Based on these estimates, there will be about 100 million uh, patients uh, ill in the United States in the first wave, 4.5 uh, million admissions, uh, almost 2 million ICU admissions. Uh, and nearly half a million uh, deaths, although the most recent estimate from the UK for the United States has that up to two million individuals. Uh, I think you really have to put this into context because there was some talk earlier that this was not as severe as people were talking about. Um, the mortality rate is six times seasonal influenza and admissions are 17 times as uh, seasonal influenza, so definitely a much more uh, severe infection. We all have been focused on social distancing, and really the goal of this is to uh, reduce the number of cases a little bit, but really more importantly, spread them over time so that they do not overwhelm the healthcare system as they did uh, in China and in uh, Italy. Um, there's been, again, modeling of this uh, so that, uh, you know, if we basically did nothing, uh, we'd get that 33% uh, increase. Even with 25, uh, 50, and 75% reductions, you can really flatten that curve pretty significantly. And that's uh, led to uh, a lot of uh, our efforts uh, uh, to close schools, restrict travel, and re restrict meetings. Uh, I can't speak heavily enough about the essentialness of hand hygiene. Every time you can, you should be washing your hands, especially anything you touch could be uh, potentially contaminated. Wash your hands all the time. Masks uh, really should only be used by healthcare workers uh, that are taking care of these patients to preserve uh, valuable resources. Moving on to prevention strategies, uh, it was just announced that the first patient that uh, is going to receive this Moderna mRNA-1273 vaccine will be dosed today. And so that's, again, record time from uh, development to implementation. I think we have to calibrate this uh, by two very important facts. One, uh, studies, uh, animal studies, which are usually done before it goes into humans, are happening concurrently with the human data. So there may be safety signals that slow development with that animal work. And there's uh, been some evidence with some of the SARS and MERS coronaviruses uh, coronavirus vaccines for immune enhancement, meaning the vaccine may make people sicker. Uh, and so this is something that uh, is definitely going to be looked at, and in some regards is good that the vaccines are being given while the virus is circulating to see if this is uh, an early signal. Thankfully, there's a number of different uh, uh, vaccine platforms that are being developed. These mRNA ones are moving forward the quickest because they can literally produce in one week enough vaccine for almost the entire world. It's a very efficient uh, system. Uh, from management, uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of the ones that, uh, that we have a little bit of data. Again, everyone has an opinion about uh, what they think we should be doing about patients. There's very limited actual data um, for many of these. A lot of these are being extrapolated from SARS and MERS data. Uh, and again, I think we have to take that very uh, much with a grain of salt, especially MERS data since it's uh, slightly divergent. Methylprednisolone uh, is not uh, recommended uh, uh, because it did not provide benefit for SARS and MERS, uh, but prolonged shedding. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in IVIG. Current uh, pools of IVIG will not have uh, coronavirus uh, uh, antibodies, and so uh, really provide probably very uh, limited uh, benefit. Uh, convalescent, convalescent plasma, the first studies were started uh, in China and Singapore. Um, they aren't yet available, but as soon as they are, uh, they likely will start. We'll talk specifically about lapinavir, ritonavir, chloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine. IL-6 blockers and remdesivir. There's a huge list of other agents uh, that are uh, being considered. Uh, I'm not going to go through those uh, in much detail. 
So let's first start uh, by talking about uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. What we have to also recognize is a lot of the data from the other viruses, this was used in combination with ribavirin. There was evidence that the addition with ribavirin increased uh, the potency of the, the combination. The numbers of patients studied are still relatively small and typically compared to historical controls, so we don't know um, if it's a true comparative. They had milder disease uh, to start in the first place. Early therapy has been associated with uh, uh, lower rates of death in SARS, lower rates of in intubation. Uh, uh, note, though, there was less steroid use in that arm, uh, suggesting, again, a potential covariant. Um, salvage, lopinavir, ritonavir, there was no difference in death, oxygen, saturation, or intubation. So again, probably not useful if someone's uh, progressed uh, pretty significantly. In the MERS outbreak in South Korea, they uh, tried a, uh, a post-exposure prophylaxis uh, study. 22 patients received lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, 21 controls didn't. All were selected healthcare workers with aerosolized generating exposures. None of the patients with uh, lopinavir ritonavir uh, developed uh, infection compared to 28%, uh, so it was a statistically different uh, difference, although relatively small with a very different uh, virus. What data do we have uh, uh, in terms of in vitro efficacy, and can this be achieved clinically? So it appears that for um, uh, uh, these viruses, the IC50 or EC50, is somewhere between six for SARS uh, and eight and a half for uh, MERS CoV. It's uh, not well known uh, what the uh, IC50 is for this uh, particular coronavirus. Uh, one of the challenges uh, is that the uh, uh, dosing of uh, 400 milligrams, uh, 100 milligrams of uh, lopinavir and ritonavir uh, may not achieve uh, uh, therapeutic uh, levels for very long. Uh, additionally, this drug is highly protein bound and the amount of drug uh, getting into the alveolar lung fluid as well as nasal secretions might be limited. So it's Efficacy, in my view, uh, really uh, needs to be uh, studied prospectively. There is a study that uh, is completed and should be published in the near future from China. The other challenge is there's significant drug-drug interactions so with this, uh, and uh, that's particularly concerning if patients are on steroids because the steroid uh, may uh, last in the system for much longer. Uh, we do have uh, a limited experience uh, in SARS-CoV-2 um, from Singapore. They used a lower dose, 200 milligram, 100 milligram twice a day for 14 days. In their overall series, the patients all did well and generally were discharged. Five patients were treated with the combination. Three had improvement in oxygens. Two patients deteriorated, one needing uh, intubation. Uh, both experienced uh, ongoing nasal carriage, so it did not appear to affect uh, viral loads in these patients. Four out of five periods uh, had uh, adverse effects. Three had uh, abnormal liver enzymes. Uh, so uh, really, uh, we still have a lot of questions, and it's very unclear from this uh, limited data, did it actually help uh, these patients? We look forward to the, the data um, from uh, China. So chloroquine and a related drug, hydroxychloroquine, is an antiparasitic agent that does have antiviral activity. Theoretical mechanisms of action, they may uh, interfere with the cellular ACE2 receptor. Uh, they may uh, in, uh, impair the acidification of the endosome, which in interferes with trafficking of the virus, uh, uh, but they may have some slight uh, immunosuppressive effects. From uh, experimental data, the IC50 is about one microgram per ml, which is easily achievable uh, with medications. Reported uh, favorable outcomes uh, uh, have been in the press, but uh, again, we have no uh, published uh, literature. The next drug that I think has a lot of uh, interest but uh, has some challenges potentially with it uh, is uh, the IL-2 receptor uh, antibody tocolizumab. Um, this basically uh, is thought to block the rise in IL-6, which is associated with uh, worse outcomes uh, uh, in these patients. I've shown you the, the dosing and the exclusion for this. It does increase fetal uh, concentrations, uh, so should be avoided uh, in pregnancy. Um, the real uh, issue, though, is likely the timing of this. If you start it too late, it's probably not going to be terribly effective. Lastly, I'll talk a little bit about remdesivir, the, the drug that uh, we've been giving predominantly to our uh, sick patients uh, here uh, and we'll be starting a trial on. <clears throat> it's a broad-spectrum nucleotide prodrug that inhibits RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. <clears throat> it's active against a huge range of RNA viruses. Uh, and inhibits uh, replication of uh, coronaviruses, including uh, MERS, in human epithelial cells. There's some in vitro data uh, of its activity in uh, cells at this point as well. Um, it uh, interferes with uh, viral polymerase. Uh, one challenge is uh, resistance appears to occur relatively frequently. Thankfully, the resistant uh, virus uh, is markedly uh, uh, less uh, fit and so rep replicates at a much uh, lower rate. 
Um, uh, the one issue uh, with it is it's an IV medication uh, compounded with cyclodextran, so concern for renal dysfunction uh, is there. Uh, other known side effects is uh, change in PT, PTT, uh, LFT abnormalities, and GI side effects as well as uh, headache. The first uh, case report of uh, patients treated in Nebraska is in uh, pre-press. Um, here is the, the data. Thankfully, the patients all did very well. Um, they only had three patients that were treated with this medication. The shading shows which patients, and in the lower panels, shows the change in their uh, labs. Uh, with the treatment, it's unclear to me um, how much uh, drug benefit was uh, given to these patients, although the majority of these patients uh, did not progress to worse illness. Um, we need bigger trials to really understand this. Uh, and then just a shout out to our local Northwestern colleagues, uh, Dr. Batier and Satchel. Uh, they're working on soluble ACE2, which uh, clear, could attach to the uh, virus and prevent uh, infection, so more to come on that. In terms of therapeutic options, uh, if you are considering commercially available drugs, be very wary of drug-drug interactions. My personal feeling, the kitchen sink approach is potentially dangerous because you could have toxicity and benefit that you're not going to be able to see uh, and harder to tweeze out uh, efficacy. We have a compassionate use uh, protocol that's up and approved as of yesterday. Uh, please uh, refer patients to the COVID-19 team. They have to be COVID positive, not on pressors, and intubated. Carrie Kruger is uh, coordinating these. We're also participating in DMID 200016, which is a really amazing study that's gotten up and running uh, here. Uh, Carrie Kruger is going to be leading the effort uh, here. Um, the way it's designed is adaptive, which means currently it's placebo versus remdesivir but they can add up to eight other therapies in so that patients are randomized across a number of different uh, individual agents so we can look at uh, variable effects. Currently, it's just placebo and uh, remdesivir. So really uh, focus on hand hygiene, covering your mouth, uh, and not coming to work sick. We're doing a lot here in our group. There'll be a meeting later this week that'll, that'll develop uh, therapeutic guidelines uh, for teams. Never miss an episode of Breakthroughs. Go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe.